Hello and welcome to lecture number 52, historical topic 5.10, Reconstruction. The theme is politics and power. The learning objective is explain the effects of government policy during Reconstruction on society from 1865 to 1877. The first key concept is broken up into two parts. The second part will be covered a little later in this lecture, and the first part says Reconstruction altered relationships between the states and the federal government. Reconstruction was the rebuilding of the South after the war. Southern cities like Richmond and Atlanta had been completely destroyed due to fighting in the Civil War, and the infrastructure needed to be rebuilt. Additionally, the state governments and local and city governments also needed to be rebuilt. Legislators needed to be re-elected back into those positions, and finally, the states had to be readmitted into the Union. The first plan of Reconstruction was Presidential Reconstruction, and it was led by President Lincoln. In 1863 is when he first began to think about what a post-Civil War United States would look like, what it would take for the southern states to come back into the Union. The way Lincoln saw it, secession was unconstitutional. It could not happen, so technically the southern states were only in rebellion and had never left. His plan for readmission or restoration said that as long as 10% of the citizens of a state pledged loyalty to the United States, then the state would be readmitted and have full state status. It was very lenient as far as the other plans are concerned. Congress, controlled by Republicans, had different ideas on the path to readmission. They wanted to have at least 50% requirement of Southerners to take this loyalty oath as outlined in the Wade-Davis Bill. It would also disenfranchise anyone who fought for the Confederacy, strip anyone who held office in the Confederacy of U.S. citizenship, and abolish slavery in the seceded states. Since Congress passed it at the end of the Congressional session, Lincoln utilized the pocket veto. That means that he just didn't sign the bill, and because the congressional session had ended, Congress had no opportunity to override Lincoln's denial. In January 1865, the 13th Amendment is passed by Congress, and then it will later be ratified by all of the required states in December of 1865. Lincoln is assassinated in April of 1865, so Andrew Johnson takes over the plans for Reconstruction. His plan is similar to Lincoln's. He wants to try and be faithful to what Lincoln originally wanted, but he also ends up putting in more strict restrictions on paper. All of the Confederate officers, people who served in the Confederate Army, and anyone that had more than $20,000 worth of property in the South was automatically disenfranchised. That means that they lost the right to vote. However, he allowed exemptions to that provision through a presidential pardon. Johnson used his pardon power freely and frequently, which resulted in a return to power for the same pre-war politicians that advocated secession. These Southern politicians start passing laws that restrict the equality that the Civil War had won for newly freed people. Radical Republicans in Congress are angry with Andrew Johnson for the conditions that he created. Johnson was a Democrat that had been brought onto the Republican Union ticket to try and get votes from the border states. Congress at the same time was trying to pass legislation to try and protect black Americans in the South in the form of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Johnson vetoed the bill, but Congress overrode Johnson's veto with the two-thirds majority. The Civil Rights Act formally gave citizenship to African Americans and tried to build in protections for them. This was made more permanent with the passage of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was necessary because Republicans in Congress believed that if a Democratic majority ever came to power in Congress, that they could simply repeal the law or pass a new one that would revoke that citizenship from African Americans. Repealing a constitutional amendment would require more work, and that's why the 14th Amendment was passed. Congress grew annoyed with Andrew Johnson, and so they take control over Reconstruction. In June of 1866, Republicans in Congress refused to seat the Southern representatives and senators that had been re-elected by the readmitted Southern states. These were former Confederate officials and Confederate officers who were going to take seats in the U.S. Congress. Congress then passes the Reconstruction Acts of 1867. It divided the South into five military districts that were overseen by the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. These acts set the conditions for readmission. Before they could be readmitted into the Union and the military would be moved from those states, each state would have to adopt the 14th Amendment, which grants citizenship to African Americans and also amend their own state constitutions to protect voting rights for African Americans. If those two things were not done, then they would not be readmitted and military reconstruction would continue. The 14th Amendment also included provisions for non-compliant states. If a state started to infringe upon the citizenship rights or the voting rights of African Americans, then they would have representatives and also electoral votes taken away from presidential elections. The logic was that they should not get representation in Congress for people that are not allowed to exercise their political rights. Radical Reconstruction continues with the passage of the Tenure of Office Act. Since the Republican Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, seen on the bottom left, was in charge of military reconstruction, 
Congress wanted to protect him from Andrew Johnson firing him. Congress passed this act that would ensure the position of the presidential cabinet, originally appointed by Lincoln. It said that if the president wanted to fire a cabinet secretary, he would have to gain the consent of Congress. Andrew Johnson, not liking being told what to do, fired Stanton. It angered Congress, and then they brought up articles of impeachment against Johnson for breaking this law. The Senate impeachment trial failed to remove Johnson by just one vote. The next key concept is on the Reconstruction Amendments. They are the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery while the 14th and 15th Amendments granted African Americans citizenship, equal protection under the laws, and voting rights. The 13th Amendment, like the key concept states, abolished slavery. However, there is a caveat which is going to become important after Reconstruction. Slavery in the United States is not allowed except as punishment for a crime for which one has been duly convicted. After Reconstruction, southern states made up of governments of Redeemer Democratic officials start passing black codes. These laws criminalize part of daily African Americans' lives in order to put them in a system where they can legally force them into involuntary servitude. For example, vagrancy laws jailed men for not having a job. Once arrested and imprisoned, they'd be hired out as cheap labor to pay off their fine. The 14th Amendment guaranteed equal protection and due process under the law. This included all persons born in the U.S. were naturalized. The implication of this wording is covered more at length in the following slides. Finally, the 15th Amendment guaranteed voting rights to citizens. Again, the wording is important as it only protects against discrimination of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. It's important to note that it does not include sex or gender in the 15th Amendment. In the next key concept, we delve deeper into the debates that arose as a result of these amendments. Reconstruction led to debates over new definitions of citizenship, particularly regarding the rights of African Americans, women, and other minorities. The 14th Amendment included the wording of persons born or naturalized in the United States. This meant that it protected immigrants, if immigrants became naturalized after the required five years. At that point, they would gain full citizenship rights. The 14th and 15th Amendment, however, did not include women or the mention of sex, despite the wording of persons. Women suffrage activists knew that was a problem and heavily campaigned for women to be explicitly included. After the amendments were ratified, women tried to gain inclusion through action. Virginia Minor was a women suffrage activist and in 1872 attempted to register to vote in the state of Missouri. She was arrested and appealed her conviction and went all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court Chief Justice Morrison Waite ruled against her. Waite said that although Virginia Minor and all other women were citizens of the United States, not all citizens are voters. This kept women from being able to vote for another 48 years when a new constitutional amendment is ratified to guarantee that right. The next key concept talks about the split that occurs with the women's rights movement over the issue. The women's rights movement was both emboldened and divided over the 14th and 15th amendments to the Constitution. On the one hand, the women's suffrage movement opposed the 15th amendment because they had been demanding suffrage and equal rights to vote for over 70 years even as far back as Abigail Adams petitioning her husband John to remember the ladies. Many women who were part of the women's rights movement were also part of the abolitionist movement. In fact, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott started their advocacy for women's rights after they were denied speaking privileges at an abolitionist convention in London. Women in the movement would have been happy that these amendments would be ratified and emboldened to see that meaningful change was possible. However, leaders like Stanton and Mott would not support the 15th Amendment for its omission of women in its language. Stanton and Frederick Douglass had a notable falling out over the issue, as Douglass asked women to allow progress to take course, even if it meant that women would wait longer for equality. In the election of 1872, Susan B. Anthony cast a ballot citing her 14th Amendment right as a citizen. She was arrested and fined $100. In her trial, she was not allowed to speak as a witness in her own defense, and when the judge dismissed the jury and issued a guilty verdict without letting them decide, she was denied the right to a trial by jury. President Grant tried to issue a pardon, but she would not accept it because if she accepted a pardon, it would have been an admission that it was a crime for a woman to vote. The 19th Amendment that would give the woman right to vote would not come until 1920. The next key concept is also broken up into two parts. They cover the result of Reconstruction. Efforts by radical and moderate Republicans to change the balance of power between Congress and the presidency and to reorder race relations in the defeated South yielded some short-term successes. Radical Republicans were led by Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner, the same Charles Sumner who was beat with a cane by Preston Brooks on the floor of the Senate. They believe in equality for women and African Americans. They are the progressives in the United States in the 1860s and 1870s. They make Congress the dominant branch because the Republicans have a two-thirds majority in both the House and the Senate. 
That means that they have a veto-proof majority that can pass any legislation whether or not the president wants to sign it. There's also moderate Republicans in Congress, but they are going to go with the flow of the radical Republicans. They fear that the Southern Democrats could take control of Congress if they don't make the laws that protect the voting rights of African Americans that live in the South. That would eventually happen when state laws passed by Southern Democrats that disenfranchise black Americans. It would also give Southern states a disproportionate advantage in representation in the House of Representatives and in presidential elections. Now that the three-fifths clause was no longer valid, every person in the state counted towards representation, even if not all of them are capable of voting. There were some short-term successes of Reconstruction. The Freedmen's Bureau was a federal agency created by Congress that acted as a relief agency for emancipated people. They were responsible for establishing schools, giving relief, food, even land in some instances. In the state of Georgia, they gave some confiscated land that belonged to former Confederate officials and Confederate officers. But some of that land was taken back once those officers made their loyalty oath back to the United States. There is an expansion of education and the establishment of black colleges like Howard University, Fisk University, and Atlanta. These are now called historically black colleges and universities, or HCBUs, that are still around today. The second part of this key concept says Reconstruction opened up political opportunities and other leadership roles to former slaves, but it ultimately failed due both to determined Southern resistance and the North's waning resolve. Political opportunities came in the form of actual black legislators in the U.S. House of Representatives, the U.S. Senate, and various other state legislatures. Iron Rebels, on the left of the screen, is the first ever black U.S. Senator appointed in 1870 in the state of Mississippi. Blanche K. Bruce on the right was the second black U.S. Senator also from the state of Mississippi. It was a huge sign of progress that had significant symbolism because they filled the same seat that Jefferson Davis, President of the Confederacy, held prior to the Civil War. To see black legislators in office within 10 years of the Civil War start was seen as a rapid progress. That partly leads to a severe backlash from white Southerners. The South Carolina Lower State House also has a similar transformation with a black majority of legislators in that state legislature. The Southern resistance came in a violent form of white supremacy. The Ku Klux Klan, or KKK, threatened this progress by threatening African Americans with violence and lynchings. They also targeted carpetbaggers and scalawags. Carpetbaggers were Northerners who came to the South to try and benefit from the reconstruction of the South. Scalawags were Southern sympathizers of the Republican Party. The cartoon on the screen is meant to threaten carpetbaggers. It's dated March 1869, and one person hanging from the tree is holding a bag with the state of Ohio inscribed in it. President Johnson, who was a Democrat from Tennessee, also opposed equal rights for African Americans. He believed that if African Americans were given equal rights, American society would become Africanized. White supremacy went all the way up to the top of the U.S. government, and therefore support for blacks in the South was not quick to arrive. Finally, the North's waning resolve leads to the end of Reconstruction. Eventually, the North is no longer able to put the same amount of pressure on the South to continue Reconstruction. In 1873, there is a financial panic that began over speculation in the railroad industry. There are runs on the banks across the North, and as the economic situation in the North worsens, there is much less support in continuing Reconstruction in the South. The next lecture will cover the event that formally ends Reconstruction, the election of 1876. Finally, here is the recap. Reconstruction strengthens the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the state governments. The federal government grows in power and importance through Reconstruction, just as it had under the Civil War. Reconstruction amendments brought structural change to the U.S. The challenge will be to enforce them. The 14th and 15th Amendments split the women's rights movement. Republicans acted to implement equal rights for ideological and practical reasons. And finally, gains of congressional Reconstruction will fade as the South continues to resist and the North loses resolve. Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, you can click on the video link on the screen. And if you're looking for more practice to help you on the AP exam, you can visit apushlights.com. I wish you the very best in all of your studying and look forward to seeing you back on the next lecture.